Live from the Fox 5 television studios in New York City, you're watching Fox 5 News at 10. Good evening. The police are moving faster now, hunting down all the people responsible for the execution of Officer Ed Byrne. The votes are almost all counted in the first primary voting in Campaign 88. As we mentioned to you earlier, Princess Di went to the opera in Brooklyn tonight. John Rowland was a trusted voice in New York news. His reassuring manner guided us through tumultuous times, helming the number one rated newscast, the 10 o'clock news, for close to 30 years. There were some very dangerous men on the loose who killed a man who worked for an armored car company. I had the privilege of anchoring with him for over six years. He taught me about fairness and presenting the news, and I felt his passion and respect for the audience who watched his nightly broadcast. Still ahead, we'll have any late developments from Libya. John began his broadcasting career in the 1960s. His first major assignment was for NBC News in Los Angeles, the year 1966. After a short stint at NBC in Los Angeles, John was hired to report for the then-owned Metro Media Station in L.A., KTTV, where he covered the Robert F. Kennedy assassination and the Charles Manson trial. December 1969, John moved from the West Coast to the East Coast to join Metro Media, which became Fox 5 News. John was on the political beat during the week and in the anchor chair for the 10 o'clock news on the weekends. He took over as the main anchor for the weeknight edition of the news in 1979. John was known for his frank delivery and his compassion for New Yorkers who were then living through the violent 70s in this city. And every now and then, he even made the news. In 1983, John and his friend were having a late night dinner at the racing club a restaurant across the street from Channel 5 Studios, when three armed men entered the restaurant and attempted to rob customers. John wrestled with one of the robbers and shot him in the leg. The other two robbers then attacked John, hitting him over the head with a gun. The attack made the front page of every local paper. I grabbed a gun and we were on the floor. All of a sudden I felt Another gun on the side of my, I could see out of the side of my head, a fellow was standing up and pointing a rifle at me. He said, I have a shotgun, I'm going to blow your brains out. And again, before I knew what happened, I had grabbed the hold of the shotgun and he was on the floor. And we were rolling around and I, I, had, I had my hands on both guns. Some shots uh, went off from the pistol. Then I heard a voice saying, all right, that's it. And I turned around and I looked up and I saw a third gun. And at that point, I said, okay. I mean, I'm outnumbered, I'm, I'm outgunned. I said, you got me. In 1988, John got into an on-air argument with a mentally ill homeless woman, Joyce Brown, also known as Billy Boggs. If I knew I was going to be attacked to by you, I oh, would I'm never, not have, come on, I've never come on your show. I'm not attacking yes, you. Yes, you have. You no, said I was trying. insane while I was on the I'm street. Saying, and, I talked to myself. To have, I joined to, it on the street. I, right. kept, I told you the reason why. And oh, okay. I never saw you at all when I was on the street. I didn't think you would have remembered. Why wouldn't I? I know who you are. All right, we have to go. I'm sorry. This is the Tenno clock news with John Rowland and Bill McCreary. Over the years, John anchored with Bill McCreary and Cora Ann Maholic and me. I remember it well. I was pregnant with my son in April of 1994. Carl will make his usual Friday appearance next with his unusual plays of the week. And he'll also have the Mets and Yanks highlight. Stay with us. Sitting next to John was always a learning lesson. He took pride in his writing and his down-to-earth communicating. It was never more evident than anchoring with him down at ground zero in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. Shortly before 9 a.m., a passenger jet, apparently hijacked by terrorists, crashed into tower number two, the north tower of the World Trade Center. Both buildings were packed with workers, thousands trying to get out of the burning skyscrapers. In 2002, John almost died at work after experiencing diverticulitis. DiCepolo bolted out of the chair and sprinted down the hallway to help out his co-worker. He wasn't prepared for what he was about to see. It was a pool of blood. It was slowly coming towards me. And my first reaction was, oh my God, was someone shot? John shared his health scare with everyone. All of a sudden, standing there reading that one story in front of that screen, I started to feel hot inside. I started to feel, feel as if my body was melting inside. I started to shake. Uh, I started to feel very hot inside and out, and I knew something was wrong. Just a few months ago in February, Steve Lacey and I Zoomed with John from his home in Florida, 
where we reminisced about working together and anchoring the most prestigious local news show. When you work for the 10 o'clock news, you didn't just anchor, you also, when you could and when it was necessary, you were on the street reporting. So we did everything. Those are days I will never, ever forget. And I cherish, cherish every, every single one of them. We also laughed about our nightcaps at Elaine's restaurant and his old stomping grounds of Studio 54. Were you anchoring then and do you have any recollection of that, John? My Studio 54 days are a haze. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is no. <laughs> and that That's was the perfect answer. <laughs> yes. And that was before my time, so <laughs> I missed out on the Studio 54 with John and Blondie. John spent his last years living with his wife Zida in Florida, enjoying being a husband and grandfather. While he was retired from anchoring the nightly TV news, his love for New York and current events was unabated. He cared until the end of his 81 years.